Okay. We've already done introductions. My name's Paul. Um, I do a lot of stuff. I, um, right now I work with a company called Neotis down the road uh, as a performance engineer. I, this summer I invented a company to manage liability, but uh, as it turns out, there's a lot of people who need advisement um, on what the hell to do in DevOps, because none of us know. Um, only the ones that are actually doing it, whatever that is. And I also work with a group uh, at the IEEE. We're building a DevOps standard, which may make some people barf. And that's okay. But on the other hand, there's big companies who see the value of doing things differently and are desperately trying to figure out how to make sure that you know, we can still fit in the world of contracts and of obligations and of shared vision between two companies. So um, I work with them and I learn a lot from that. Um, I also do some product strategy. And if there wasn't a combination of Boring words. I didn't realize that until I saw this up here. Testing, strategy, DevOps. Okay. So, good start so far. Um, I'm also in the community, in the Boston DevOps group, and also Mobile T. If you haven't checked those meetups out, you should. So, um, these, this slide deck. Was, was that kid? Oh, yeah. Well, so, I've got some kids. So, I'm full-time at my job. I'm additionally full-time at my personal consulting and brand and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'm also full-time with my kids. Not really full-time, but as full-time as I can afford after that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I keep busy. Thank you. His name's Liam. Uh, so if you want to get this deck, because there's going to be a lot of links and a lot of details, and I really um, don't, I don't speak as an authority. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do is trying to just make sure that the patterns that I see are shared, and what works, works, and what doesn't, doesn't. And so there's a lot of content in this deck that I'll cover, hopefully very quickly, but the links are there. And so it's very important if you're at all interested in actually learning something from this, you're probably going to want to go back to at least something in this deck, and that's how to do it. So you can connect with me on Twitter, and it's pinned right there. And um, aside from the obvious time value of no bullshit, I also think that we can actually get to the source of what we're trying to talk to faster if we drop the pretense. So I apologize if I'm brusque or if I'm asking specific questions, but that's usually just to get to the point. Right? Um, I do a lot of research on my own. By research, I don't mean like federally funded research. It's me funded. It's my after hours. It's my drive to have conversations that make a difference for me. And it's, in many cases, turnout makes a difference for other people too. So that's why I'm involved in the meetup circuit. That's why I cover local tech events as much as I can, taking personal days off of work to do that, make connections, and really talk to people that are doing this kind of stuff at many different levels. So not just coders. I mean, Dave works as a recruiter. Um, this guy, he's gainfully unemployed half the time. Uh, Corey Quinn, and I did a, so you can, you can check all this stuff out at paulspruce.io, right, I publish there. Um, I also do some research with the companies that I work with from time to time, full time, and uh, they give me the luxury of a megaphone. Sometimes I can use their email distribution list to do interesting research that I find interesting and turns out to be very useful because in this case, uh, as it turns out, teams who plan for performance actually have less problems. So that was a survey. And then um, obviously it doesn't stop when I get home. Dude, I never stop. And so I like to experiment everywhere. And this is my recent experiment with my weekends, planning out the weekends, trying to get the kids to align on a goal, which is what we will talk about for a little while here. So even as it applies to family life, the stuff that I'm hoping that I think I've hit on that I want to present, it's, uh, it's a work in progress but I'm trying to get to the right level of abstraction that's useful, that engages your brains, that makes you think, how is that different at my organization? So uh, a few key concepts. Um, the first one is obviously framing your work. Uh, we'll get into that. Um, specifically having goals, 
a strategy. I'll describe what the hell I mean by a strategy. Um, alignment is a big deal. Who here, just like positive, negative check. When I say alignment, positive, negative, okay, okay, it's interesting. Um, the other one is own your own flow, like Kanban flow. Has anybody read Personal Kanban, the book? That's a really good book. It's worth like the, what, 20 minutes it takes to read through that paperback. Basically shows you how if you're not processing through your personal life, like some teams might do at a profession, then you're not making any progress on some things. Think about all the things at home that you still have to do, right? Couldn't you apply Kanban? So I've been thinking about that. I've been implementing that in my life, and it's really helped to deal with, what, five or six different lines of business that I deal with. Um, and then also, because of the bandwidth problem for me, quite frankly, I don't have a lot of bandwidth unless I focus really hard. When you focus really hard, you can't focus on 30 things at once. So I like um, what Dan North says, and some of this stuff comes from various names in the industry. Who knows the name Dan North? He used to be from ThoughtWorks. Okay, so there's links at the end. I really encourage you to just watch or listen on the road or whatever, but listen to Dan North and listen to some of the links that I sent. So um, his thing is, if, if, a th if a number of things can't fit in your head, then you can't reason about them. You can't actually deal with the bigness of the problem because you haven't brought it down to something that you can reason about in a realistic amount of time. And if you can't, chances are you can't communicate well about that to other people, and maybe they can't either. So you really gotta find this, the right size. And for me, that's three things. Literally, if something doesn't fit in three bullet points, screw off. Like, I, I, I'm sorry, but like a slide shouldn't have more than three bullet points, otherwise you're talking about it for more than five minutes, right? That's the example. And then the last thing is, um, I like the lists in my head. I like to take a MISI approach, which, is, which stands for essentially mutually exclusive, sufficiently exhaustive, right? The items in this list, should generally be exclusive of each other. They're different things, they're not conflated. And then sufficiently exhausted is, do we have a big enough list? Is it too big? Is it not big enough? Does it cover just enough? And then we move on. So that's how you make some of your meetings far more impactful, right? If you're gonna send a meeting invite out, make sure people know what the inputs are, what to bring, what to expect, and also what outcomes come out of that. Simple stuff, everybody knows that, we should. So, uh, what do I mean by frame your work? And what, what, I just want to level set on the word strategy for a second. Um, so, framing your work, what, what's worked for me is to take a GSOT approach. A goal, a strategy level, these are different levels of information. There is a goal, there is typically a, one or two strategies, approaches on how to get to that goal. There's objectives, specific things that, like milestones, if you will. And then there's tactics. There's just the shit we gotta do, right? There's the little things, like write that Selenium script. That's a tactic. Uh, so when you have a framing that you can actually put this on a slide and you can align very quickly if you've got the right information. And how do you get that? You do that with somebody. Whether it's your boss or whether it's your client or your customer, you share this thing together, you both own it because you both had input on it and you've had early input. And then you can socialize it around and introduce others, right? But who others? Everybody? All the bosses? CC all? No. The right people, right? Get the right people involved. And you can start with your view of right, but as soon as you introduce your view of right, that introduces people. And if there's something that doesn't mess things up more, it's introducing more people, <laughs> um, which I say sarcastically. Um, the other thing is you have to be able to, to belly up and say, I will put a measurement on this and I will own and be responsible for this, right? To your point, if nobody drives it, it never gets done or done properly. Or worse, it gets done improperly and then causes trouble. So make sure that you have somebody who will own that thing. And it could be a group, right? They can own different details or maybe different objectives. But again, ownership is key here. And fortunately, yesterday it just got published. This article on DevExchange that I wrote for them 
that I wrote for me, and then I kind of said, you need to publish this. Um, that's the basis for this talk. So if you want to have an 11 minute read, right, on the weekend, I don't know what you do on the weekends. I just work all the time, constantly, whether it's kids or whatever. So this is an 11 minute read. Um, it distills a lot of what I see in large enterprises as both positive patterns and anti-patterns, how to do this stuff. Okay, so I can't get away from this problem, which is, you know, anytime anybody presents something about DevOps, they have to have their version of it. And that's just the nature of DevOps, right? You have to share and talk about what you mean about that. So the closest I could come up to, and this is not definitive, this is just my closest today. Maybe tomorrow it will change. But DevOps is an approach to engineering culture that empowers software teams, maybe including hardware, software teams to collaborate, to improve and align on delivering value to end users. These three things are the heart of DevOps. Collaborate, improve, and align. That's my view. And how we do that? Well, when it comes to how you actually do that, usually it's on the substrate of the delivery pipeline. Shit goes down there. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work there, and somebody's gonna eject it like a flaky test, like a bad habit. So, where we end up collaborating, whether we like it or not, is in that pipeline. Is what gets put in there. Is it code? Is it tests? Is it configuration code? Is it the pipeline code itself? Whoops, somebody messed up the pipeline, or somebody introduced a new dependency. Right? That's where we do, that's where we, fortunately and unfortunately sometimes, come together. But the why is a different thing. Why we do this isn't just to make more software like robots, right? We deal with this problem at work. This problem is a people problem, it's a process problem, and it's a technology problem. And in between those things are things like technology skills, right? The culture between people and process. And if you read books like The Goal or The Phoenix Project or all those DevOps books, they fundamentally get to the point where it's not, culture isn't a wishy-washy thing. Every one of you work for a company that has a different culture. It's like a different island. It's like a different sovereign nation. And when you move, you feel it, right? When you move to a new job, very different, right? So this is what we have to walk through and walk into every single day, right? And that's a complicated problem. It's also, there's tons of opportunity there, right? Sharing skills. When I don't know something, I walk over to my AWS guy. How do I do this on the CLI? I don't know. He knows. So we get to share, and we, we also get to improve that view. That's not just stuff that we walk into and have to deal with. If you're dealing with your job, fix it one way or the other. Leave or figure out how to improve that situation. So I'm going to move through this a little bit quick. The long and the short is that this is how we used to think about our problem, our problem used to be, oh gosh, we can't go fast enough and people want more stuff. And it used to be like, well, capability for innovation on traditional infrastructure. This was a conversation about the cloud. It was a point of view to show a problem that people were having with on-prem hosted stuff in, in their own data centers and why it was so important to move to the cloud. Honestly though, this is a good, this is good if you actually get rid of this more specific thing of infrastructure and replace it with thinking. Because DevOps challenges the way that these organizations think about the importance of promoting improvements. So that's how it used to be. And really now what we're seeing is that, you know, if you've ever heard of customer obsession, anybody heard, heard that term? Right. Well, I like to be obsessed about the things I like to be obsessed about. It's not necessarily you or somebody else. It, it's, but there's, it's important to be able to, to share that goal, to say that's really why we should be walking into work. Not to just be in service of somebody, but to stop making broken shit in the world. Right? To make less broken or, gosh forbid, actual stuff that works really well and makes people happy and makes people want to give us money for that product so that we can pay the jobs, right? So 
In this case, we have an opportunity here, a huge opportunity. If you actually think about this long enough, there's an opportunity because both of us, if we care about this, it's going to mean that we're both interested in accelerating delivery for the right reason. Who's in, a, who's in a job that tries to make you go faster? Just push harder, harder, harder. And they haven't even given you a reason why. It's just, no, you got to speed up. What, because you're too slow? Like, there's no goal, right? They haven't provided a vision that makes you want to do that. If anything, it's the opposite. It's the anti-pattern of that. But to, to do this thing, to push value out to people, it takes being able to get to the right pace of delivery. It also takes small and frequent changes. You can't be shipping six-month releases and expect that that's not a six-month-sized bucket of crap that you're going to have to deal with. So you've got to cut that up. And the more you cut that up, the more you realize, hey, you know what? I like being done. I like actually pressing the done button, feeling like I did that thing and I can move on. Right? And then underlying that, you have to have efficient skills, efficient process, and efficient tools. So here's my challenge to all the QA people in the room. If the goal is to put value out to people, how do you want to be perceived? Because my conversations with a lot of people that work in the bowels of a Fortune 500, usually it goes, well, they just think that we're shredding money. Like, they want to scale back the cost of testing. Because guess what? They're just thinking about testing. In reality, testing is about risk management and mitigation, for the most part, as implemented. That's usually what tests are for, to prove that we didn't break something important, that we're not screwing ourselves over with this code push. On the other hand, there's this entire thing, ooh, innovation. But before innovation, there's improvement. And so, these two things are actually both necessary. My work with the IEEE confirms that it's absolutely necessary to have an understanding of the risks that you're taking with the software you're building and for there to be things like organizational test or risk policies. How many five people startups have an organizational testing strategy? It's not necessary. Maybe not at that level, unless they're doing something that I don't know, goes into medical devices, That's, that can be problematic. So risk mitigation and management is important, right? but the problem is historically it's been viewed as a waste, a cost center, a sunk cost of doing business and software. And then there's the other one, which is, hey, are we actually doing something that increases the volume of the revenue stream of the organization? So I remember an article that came out from <clears throat> a, a, a company I used to work with. And it always rattled me. It was called, There Ain't No ROI in Testing. Has anybody kind of heard that concept before? Like framing like the, the test work really isn't about return on investment? Yikes. That's stupid, because honestly, it's true. If you're only looking at testing as to make sure that what you're delivering meets expectation, just enough, right? If you're on the bottom of this curve, if you're about mitigation, about just automation for automation's sake, or about even just poking around, explore, explore, but not connected to not only delivering, but also real improvement on top of what's been delivered, then yes, you'll will always be a cost center. So how do we flip that? What do we focus on? What are some things, examples of some things, where you can actually turn testing into a return on investment? So I propose two things. One, implementing the knowledge. You're the, messing with software and trying to get it to be automated, especially in a script, teaches you a lot about that software. And so you're going to learn a lot of things as you go along, as you probably have. But the question is, where do you stash those things? How does that become from a waste stream into a value stream? And I propose that that's actually knowledge or learning implementation. That you have to take the next step and say, we learned something. We need to put it into practice. Then the other thing is hypothesis generation. Who's heard of hypothesis-driven decision making? 
That's why we're trying to cut our releases into like day, week releases. It's like a company only has what? If they're releasing once every three months, they only have four times where they can potentially do something better with their software. But if you're releasing every week, you have 52 of those times. And so businesses have the opportunity to hypothesize about how to change, how to adjust just a little. So when you, as a, somebody who knows the software really well, can flip it over and say, I hypothesize that we would get better revenue if we had this thing over here. Because it was hard to automate. It's a pain in the ass to do on real devices. And maybe some of these things we even have to actually do manually because there's no support in the automation, like uh, thumbprint or fingerprint stuff, right? So this is, but this is where you get these hypotheses. You, you think about what you're doing and you try to figure out what is the next better thing that we could do. And that becomes a value stream to product management. I bet a lot of you actually feel this because you get to work directly with product management or a development organization. So it's there, but turning it from a trickle into a fire hose is a very different thing. So anyway, um, the other thing that, that I learned last year working with Perfecto, and it was said by this guy, um, was also right, less defect mitigation. We're not, we're not in the job of mitigating defects. What we need to do is focus on preventing them in the first place. So if you think about the testing as not just doing the thing that proves that it's working as expected, but actual learning about how it could work better, now all of a sudden you can start to put those learnings into practice and preventing these issues from occurring at all in the first place. So in the Q&A session just before this talk, there were questions that eventually led us to this conversation about right fit. Right? And that is a key principle in DevOps is that it really takes a lot of tailoring. There's, there's no like one DevOps, there's no DevOps manifesto, there's no Six Sigma, there's no uh, standard yet. <clears throat> there's no standard yet for how to do the DevOps. And if you're doing the DevOps, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. It's a mindset. It's an approach to software engineering. So. To tailor this, you really need to think about this in at least these three dimensions. There might be more. This might be, hey, the MISI might not be complete, but it's also three things that fit in my head. So uh, the first thing is right fit. And by that, what I mean is testing should be right fit to, first off, risk-based decisions. An organization might have to uh, have contracts with different size companies and in order to mitigate the risk of their revenue stream literally falling out from under them because maybe two customers had a bad SLA breach because somebody pushed the wrong code, or maybe there was a data mi uh, migration at the wrong time, right? that's a risk that that company should really think about as opt for better coverage. So this kind of conversation, what risks does the organization want to optimize for capturing is a very important Question to ask. That's a higher level question to ask. And you might not be in a place where you can do that without being brushed off. So find the right person. Find the right people if that, if that applies to you. And take it not on yourself, but on the team. Uh, the other thing is right fit to your organizational or project. And I hate the word maturity, because it almost seems like any time it's used, there's like one way. Everybody has their own maturity models, their CMMI, there's all sorts of ways to look at that. Honestly, what I mean is maybe the flip side of maturity, whatever, is really the better question to ask is, what's the appetite? If the appetite of your team is to automate all the things, you've got a much easier path to actually trying out automated things than people who are, well, you know, we couldn't figure it out two years ago, so that's been relegated to the back, the back burner. So you really have to think about if you're going to uh, especially automate things, um, that part of the tailoring is to the, the organizational appetite. Uh, and then the last thing is everybody knows what best of breed solutions means, right? Instead of having one massive solution that's OK at one thing and sucks at everything else, you take it upon yourself to find right fit. And that's 
all about what DevOps and automation is about right now. You can plug all sorts of things together, and thanks to APIs. So, with best of breed solutions, the thing is, um, every team might want their own slightly different tool stack, and that has to be okay with the organization. You have to find a way to convince an organization that you're not going to mandate the use of one tool and that is all. One tool for this one thing. Large companies would not like people saying that. Fuck them. The other thing is, um, these might not always be free. You might find yourself twiddling away at an open source solution for literally days and nights at a time, if you're like me, obsessed about something, right? In reality, you're not the only person. If the organization has mandated that you must come with a zero cost solution, guess what? You don't just have to turn to stuff that doesn't cost anything. You can think about the time and the money that you're wasting on a set of processes over here that if you had a different set of processes or tools, it would get you back some revenue. That's what normally happens actually um, uh, in the sales cycle when people are moving from monolithic tools to much more best of breed tools. They start to think, hey, we, we typically spend the money over here, but if we have something leaner and more fit to our stuff, we can actually funnel that and then maybe even give some, bit, some money back to things that we want to do, right? Other tools or other solutions. So uh, in terms of right fit, <coughs> I don't think I have to convince anyone that minimal artifact management overhead, <coughs> right? Like less artifacts you're managing, the better. Um, but really make sure that whatever you pick in terms of solutions has a, a, a future, right? Has a little bit of headroom where it's not just meeting today's concerns, but it's, it's flexible enough. Open APIs, um, you know, integrations with lots of partners. That's important to think about when you're thinking about changing in order to fit these various teams and their needs. Uh, and particularly when it comes to risk-based prioritization, I'm not an expert at all the different risk methodologies and frameworks, but I do know that typically it's the impact to the business is about these kinds of things. Like we, we got slow velocity, uh, poor adoption of our application. Um, we've got all sorts of uh, problems with revenue because you know Black Friday hit us. Um, and then there's the other element, which is essentially likelihood of defects, right? So where are you likely to have defects? And that really does depend on the technical teams that we surround ourselves with. How well versed is the architect? How busy is he such that he can't look at something, take a 30 minute meeting with the rest of the group to figure out if this bare metal server wrapped in an API is actually a significant part of a risk factor in a, in a, in a motion to move a lot of stuff to the cloud. So well, all, the, all this means to say is like, there are different levels of risk and the risk usually goes in terms of things like, you know, environment complexity, architectural complexity. Um, as you carry technical debt, you have to, at some point you deal with it. So it gets bigger, right? And it gets more complicated here. And this is kind of, it's and it, the shift left thing. It doesn't matter to me, the shift right, shift left stuff. But this is where like, if you can guard yourself from certain things early, right? And then progressively introduce layers of, of like safety nets around you. That's what a regression suite is at the end of the day. You know, and if you're running subsets of your certain regression suites based on change, changes to specific modules or stuff, that's really all it is, right? It's just capturing the stuff that might more likely be, uh, have a defect in it, as opposed to leaving it towards the end. Uh, so, right time. Um, progressive testing, I'll talk about that in a, in a second. Um, and then just-in-time coverage. Look, if you need to task the team over a little to deal with an issue, right? Yeah, it, it, there's a little bit of friction there sometimes, but you know what it's like to put out fires. I'd rather, I'd rather be reallocating a team's time to deal with something that's super critical before I release it than dealing with all the fires in production that it might cause. So um, the right timing in terms of tailoring a test strategy has to incorporate the concept of being able to do just-in-time work uh, on, that, on that app. Uh, also, there's a concept in the goal, which is a book by Eliyahu Golrat, and um, 
he, he pulls out a couple of concepts that are important, one of which is dependent events. Um, if one thing must occur before the other, that's not waterfall. And you know what? Waterfall is not like a bad thing for certain types of systems that don't change all that much or have a massive amount of regulation. It's just a tool. It's just a, what we were doing back then, which everybody now hates and swears off. It's just like DevOps is a tool, is an approach that you can use as a tool in your tool belt. Same thing with Agile, right? Same thing with pair programming and stream programming and all those programmings. Um, in terms of dependent events, you really gotta ask yourself, what's the right time to run these tests? And that might be triggered by what? Your pipeline, a, uh, a merge, it might be triggered by a nightly build or by, ah, maybe not the code changing, but the configuration itself. Right? Or something that happens in ops, if there are certain servers that get migrated, you might want to take one of those servers out of the rotation right? and do a, maybe a performance test on it in its new configuration, pull it out of commission. Right? You still got enough. You got a couple of servers there, so it can balance that. Do the performance test, get the analysis, verify that SLAs are going to be OK in a long burn, and then put it back into production. If these are the kind of things that you need to think, like what should trigger what type of testing? Um, and that doesn't always mean definition of done. That's not Department of Defense, it's definition of done, right? If you stick thou shalt must performance test everything in a definition of done, you're never going to get to performance testing. So the point is, um, if you think about when this occurs, the next question is to ask, how long is this thing going to take? Because if you say on every single merge, do all the things, all the things take three straight days if we wanted to do all the things. So it's the right size and the right time uh, that fits together. And this is, again, this concept of statement of work versus work in progress. If you're being handed jobs just to do, you know, like you're just a work center, that's, that's not helping do what we did before, which is turn you from a cost center into a value center. That's on you, by the way. Like, it should be on the organization. But the organization, it's just a piece of paper. There are, we are the organization. There are people that make this up. And some people are more reasonable than others, right? But if you're being treated like a center of uh, a, a work center, like a machine in a cog, or a cog in a machine, the, the, the management of that uh, is, an, is an issue. You should, that's a red flag to say, what we need to do is move towards more of testing as a work in process. Right? Which sounds a lot more like Devi stuff, right? Manager whip limits, those kind of things. Well, that's because as you start to become more part of that, you're going to be able to manage, you're, you're going to have to fit to those cycles. So instead of it being like, here's the big binary, go run all your tests for two weeks and come back, that, that doesn't work anymore. So you need to integrate into that work in progress. An example of that is, uh, this is what I mean by most people think about this and say waterfall. Uh, all I mean is that these are dependent events. You can't, you can't build something before you code it, can you? What's up? Can you briefly explain the, the SOW to work in progress concept again? Sure. It's really just, I work with a lot of people in the QA business. Um, people who are embedded, people who are completely their own center of excellence still. And then service providers, a lot of service providers, like, you know, all the big names. And um, there are some people who just like to be handed a contract and say, you will do six months, three years of testing. And these are the types of tests. And then there's these gaps of, of time. Uh, you have to do that work, but then it's like this handoff, this complicated handoff. And so what I mean is statement of work, meaning like, you go do your thing, little, little tester boy. Right, like go do the thing that with no context, with no like connection to the bigger picture of why this is important at that time, right? Going from that to being part of the work in process, being in the agile planning sessions, understanding that there are performance impacts on every single story card, whether you have them there or not, that those should be written down as non-functional requirements or acceptance requirements. Who's gonna do that unless except for you? And you can't do that unless you're in the room, in the planning room with the team who's shipping the stuff out. So that's a very different thing than statement of work, 
which says, we're going to build this thing. It's going to be perfect. You just prove it with your little test. You know? That's a very different mentality. But I would hope that we move from the former towards the latter, right? Like, does that sound like a decent progression to people? Should it be this way? Should it be both ways? Yes? It kind of depends on the role, too. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, there are certain times where you just want somebody to do, the, do the, yeah. get, you know, get the work done because nobody else is doing it. And then there are yes. certain times when you really need those figures. Uh, but I think what, what, is important, what is really important is that everybody knows what the mission is, what the goal is, yes. what the bigger picture is. And that's, that's usually what I find is that people who are just treating testing like a statement of work and just get it done will do the same thing we've done before, just faster? I don't know. That, that's, that, that is completely disconnected from what you just said, which is that we are sharing a vision that we're going on the same path. So, anyway, uh, thank you. That's, that was, that's good. That's a good point. Um, so, this, this is an example of thinking about the pipeline, but strip all the other stuff, like the, the, the build cycle and the pull from Git repo stuff, and just think, like, these are stages that have to occur, like, in a dependent order, right? You cannot release something you haven't planned for it. Like, so there's a dependent order. And if you think about it, this whole thing, like usually the Snake Charmer DevOps Eternity, we're going to be doing DevOps for Eternity symbol, if you've ever seen that, that really all we're doing is we're trying to link up the, the measurement of did we have the impact we wanted to, all the way into, oh, by the way, today's plan. Because we're in today now, and we did something yesterday, and we, need to, we did it for a good reason, we need to have that now. Uh, so this is a pure testing it's just like a little example of like how testing activities right, fit across the entire pipeline. There is no test phase, no test stage in this framing because I want to pull that out. The testing occurs across the entire thing. And if you're in the planning stage, that might mean you're writing some, literally your Cucumber scripts, right, along with some proposed prototype. Flow case modeling, same thing. It doesn't take two, three hours to do these things. If you can find a way to optimize so that you're done with that test plan before you're even out of the meeting, oh my God, you'll see, you'll see how quickly you're invited into those meetings again. Right? Because not only are you done with the work, but you also understand that rush things that need to be rushed. Right? Being part of the plan, having security, performance, non-functional uh, criteria in the story is important enough to rush that. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, the number one thing across this is that testing is everywhere, and there is a time budget for testing, and that changes as you get earlier in this cycle. There's not a lot of time. Like, you can't run all your functional tests every time somebody builds something in Visual Studio or IntelliJ or something, that, right? Even unit tests, you can't necessarily run all your unit tests on every local build. You wouldn't do that. You'd build a couple times, mess with things, figure out what's working, think you got it right, and then run your unit test. So there's a very slim time budget for testing here, but as you ship that up to your build server, where it's a shared environment, now all of a sudden it goes from seconds to minutes. So um, keep that in mind. There's no more days or weeks. And, and, and that remind, was great, me remind me again your name. My name is Rob. Rob. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so, I think the, the previous point was really good. Um, you know, you talked about all, how all these things are necessary. Mm -hmm. And um, these are very important. If you do these very often, you improve how many minimum sellable products you have. Yes. So, yeah. you know, some people like to do this in six months, but if you do this more often, let's say, in Six hours. Yeah, you're going to be you know better off. Well, <laughs> sometimes, right? Sometimes, and depending on the story, depending on you know what you're building, things like that. depending on where you are. Remember that little bubble diagram, the culture, and all that stuff, right? Correct. You might be here on those elements, and you're eventually maybe going to get better, but it might not be the right time yet to do things too fast. That's where we start to feel the pressure 
of the acceleration of software delivery when, quite frankly, companies haven't paid for our AWS certificates, maybe. They haven't given us time to do this stuff, right? And we have lives after work. So if it's not part of work, if we haven't figured out how to get the organization to educate us, <clears throat> then that'll be a problem too. Uh, I promise I'm only halfway through. Yeah? No? Oh, oh man, it must be like eight o'clock. All right, so um, right size. Progressive safety nets. Um, we're, we're basically talking subsets of tests, right? It's, it's not just the type of test. Unit tests can only get you so far. Uh, they're not going to tell you what it was like on a mobile device. Very different types of tests elicit different behaviors from a system, right? And target specific things in a system. So you need these different types of tests. They have different time budgets. You need to be able to progressively size your safety nets across that delivery pipeline. Um, I, would, I would prioritize changes, new changes coming down the pipe before I expect to run the regression test every day three times a day. You could do that off to the side if you want to, if you have the infrastructure to do that. But quite frankly, I'd rather be working with the, the person who's shipping a specific feature that's going to be rolled out to 5% of our users tonight. I'd rather be helping him write his tests or helping her figure out how to get performance testing on that thing beforehand, or at least metrics injected into this stuff so that like, after it's released, you can see its effect. Um, introducing reality incrementally, that comes from my work with Perfecto, right? You can't run all your tests on all the devices you want to. So maybe you start with like four of the critical devices in every build. Every build runs these critical, specific uh, functional tests on a small subset of devices. Or maybe you run a small load test on the APIs just to prove that you haven't done something wildly stupid. Then as it goes along, as, it, as the code gets promoted to be more, for have more confidence in the fact that it's not broken, you can do incrementally larger things. You can introduce more devices. And you can do that less frequently. That's a great thing, right? So it's still in keeping with this concept of the regression suite. We always have to run that before we actually cut a release, for sure, right? So we still have to do that at the end. But what you're doing is you're catching the fish that should have been caught super early with those smaller nets. Does, uh, does this make sense to everybody? I'm just kind of, OK. Um, and match to market, right? specifically for devices or browsers, right? You want to be able to align with not the infrastructure you have because it's already set up, but what people are actually using in production. Look over at your GA stats, look over at your analytics from your mobile app, figure out what devices, platforms, environments, conditions they're using and map to that because that's what gets you the money, is working well on their devices or their platforms or where they are. So the example of the load test, because I'm, I'm a uh, load testing performance nerd. Um, and so a, a canonical example, it's not, it's just, a, it's just an anecdotal example, example here, is, you know, load tests. Do you run them all the time? None of the time? Do you only run the big ones just before the release? The answer is yes to all those things, right? There, there are some things that you don't have to worry about on every time, like third-party APIs, you're not going to be load testing third-party APIs every time there's a merge, right? Because you've got SLAs, because uh, who was it? Somebody was talking to me earlier about, like, you can't actually run the load test on your third-party API. They'll shut you down, right? You'll run out of tokens. Like, uh, Twitter, Twitter has the 420 maintain your comm or enhance your comm. Is there, is there message back to you after you've, like, exhausted the amount uh, of your API call limits? So you can't necessarily do that, and there might be not enough infrastructure in your dev environment that even is even close to the staging or the production environments. But the idea is to have a strategy that's aligned to maybe your triggering, uh, your trigger events, that actually has the appropriate amount of coverage to catch the small stuff before it leaks to this thing, because you're only going to be running this, what, pre-release. And you don't want an obvious and stupid error up here to be caught in the net at the end such that you have to rerun it at the end again and delay the release. So um, for, for load testing, uh, test coverage, load performance test coverage, 
It's about how many people you're throwing at the thing. It's about the scope, how many number of workflows you're running, um, and then the geographic conditions, the Wi-Fi conditions, that kind of stuff. So for load testing, this is test coverage specific. But this concept also applies to regression testing, yeah, to load testing, um, to SLA validation. Right? Where and when do we do SLA validation? Which parts of our infrastructure do we do that on? APIs, the end-to-end -end tests, a mobile device, right? Those SLA validations uh, could also benefit from a grid that's aligned to maybe these triggers, maybe slightly different, but this is just a frame, right? And you should be able to sit down in front of your team and say, how does the new stuff that we're doing since you know, John left or since you know, that guy quit, we're down one person, we're down two people. How are we going to mitigate that bandwidth drop with what we know we should be doing? Which ones? And we have a conversation about that. We have a conversation not just with the QA team, but with the delivery team. Because they're the ones that are also on the hook to delivering something that works. So we have that conversation with the whole group. But what are we going to do about the two people that aren't here and there's no bandwidth? It's not a whiny factor. It's a we still have to do the thing. How are we going to get that done? Which ones don't you want to do? Which ones would you say, we're not going to do this time, and accept that risk? So, uh, One question. Yeah. For the, like, yes. Can you please explain to me how to read the legend or the chart? I don't know. I have no idea. So, uh, <laughs> wait, who wrote this? Uh, so large, large meaning like huge surface area. Surface area like a really large database test, right, as opposed to... Uh, uh, let's see, maybe you, maybe you actually do a small third-party API test um, once a week just to prove that their SLAs actually, they're meeting their obligations. Um, in terms of infrastructure, maybe you're talking about a medium-sized stack on medium instances as opposed to the like, full-on production stack just to get the baselines right, on that infrastructure. So it's, again, like I said, this stuff is anecdotal. It needs, it's, it's more of the cookie cutter that I would love to see some of you folks just take what you already do and just kind of put it in the cookie cutter and frame it up a little and then tell me how like wildly off this example is. I would love that um, because I, my guess is that it is, right? For various different groups, they have various different products. The outcome, their process is different. The only other thing I would say is um, one of my great pleasures of working at Perfecta last year was um, to work right next to this guy, Iran. Uh, and he, uh, for years now, have been putting out something called the Digital Test Coverage Index. Who's heard of this thing? It's a downloadable resource. Oh, dear Lord, please, please. This is a priority. If you're involved in testing and testing on specific devices, this tells you when new things are going to come out. It also has pages of geographically diverse uh, uh, which browsers and which configurations, which operating systems, which mobile devices are in use in different geographic regions around the world. So if that matters to you, that's really important to have. This is what I'm talking about, is getting the right coverage, which devices that you actually need based on your customer's uses based on your market, that should be part of the test plan, right? That should definitely be part of the test plan. Um, and then he also, uh, uh, I also did a chapter in his book um, last year too, which was pretty cool about flaky tests. So all this stuff is in, if it's not in this, it's in the links in the narration notes because I don't write notes, clearly. I'm not that kind of guy. So the notes have the links to these things as well. That's why I say the slide deck's important. So, starting to wind this down in summary, what I'm interested in is distilling the learnings into the process. You can't think about process like it's this rigid pipe that you have to find your way and fit through. It is what we make it. We make the world around us, we make the team around us, and we make the process. And yes, process is really hard to change because organization, Right? But who else is going to do it? Right? What? The AI drones, the, the mindless autonoma up in the cloud, is going to fix your business for you? I don't know yet. Maybe that's what some of the AI 
the new startups in uh, Boston are going to do. That would be cool. Um, I've always looked forward to being told what to do by a robot since the 1980s. Um, so specifically for Selenium, um, I think metadata really matters. Who uses annotations? Who writes stuff in Java? Any, anybody write their Selenium cases in Java? OK, half the group, right? So uh, anybody want to tell me quick if they use annotations, like tags on different classes? Yeah, we actually built out uh, something called Test Health Platform, which is a custom um, JUnit based, but really JVM based um, metadata tagging solution. Um, so every we, we can basically put in strongly typed mapping to teams, components of the application, uh, freeform tags, pretty much anything we want to do. Um, it really helps us, A, keep track of like all the execution status. Yep. So we can notify people, teams, if their tests fail. Um, in addition, we can do sort of sliced runners. We want to run like this component only, so we have all that data there. It's That's really nice great. Um, He's going to present that for us. Yeah, we, what I heard you say sure, was sure. that you would present that for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll present it. Sure. Is is it anything that is like super proprietary or is no? It's uh, it's all off the shelf stuff. I mean, um, you know, I'll have to get clearance to, to present it, yeah. of course. But um, I, I think it might be useful for the team and the group. Yeah. I mean, we're really excited about it. Um, we have a huge monolith that we have to kind of figure out who owns what. Um, yes. Nobody owns anything right now, so I, I think this tooling is going to help us a lot. Segmentation. Really what we're talking about is segmenting different tests in different ways, like having different dimensions of a test. A test can be, a, can be marked as a regression test. It can be marked uh, with a specific JIRA ID because that test was created to prove that this problem won't freaking happen again. I've seen that before. I've seen modules. I've seen feature teams. I've even seen people annotate their tests based on a branch, which I don't understand that at all. Because wouldn't you just have that test be committed as part of the branch? Anyway, um, but sometimes, I mean, like, you have to segment it, go for it. Tags are really important. Annotations are really important, specifically in Java. And since I'm not a Ruby nerd, I don't know how to do that in Ruby. Um, for the three people in Burlington, they'll probably write Ruby. Ruby. Um, also, um, some of the learning, I've, I've had the fortune of hanging out with a lot of Fortune 500s, particularly in banking, um, with Capital One. There's, I've got a few friends in Capital One. And I've been able to see the way that they actually do promotion of tests and depromotion. Demotion? Uh, the, the idea that these tests can't, that you have to prove that the test is not flaky in, a, in a, a separate branch, in a separate build cycle before you promote that into the full, like, the, the master, right? So promotion of these, the, the process of promoting uh, tests that you're confident aren't going to introduce flakiness into your actual build process, into your, uh, into your develop, or even, or your production, your release. Um, that's important, too, right? Uh, and then also, I've seen a lot of teams starting to take performance trends and feed them back into, like for instance, the tool that um, the company that I work with, Neotis, uh, their Neoload. It's like when you start it up, there's an open API that it exposes, right? So it gives you the right to be able to actually work with the tool through an API, uh, even though it's a desktop app. And you can actually modify the SLAs that you set in your test based on information coming from some other system. So the openness is super important so that you can connect the dots and actually create things like self-healing SLAs. Um, and then another thing that annotations can do is actually connect you up with uh, business context. So what I mean by that is, aside from the things that I might have already mentioned, um, I've seen companies use this, especially in the, in the espresso world, like on the Android side, that they write espresso. Tons of tags. And there's all different ways or reasons why you might do that. We've already talked about that. But ultimately, it's so that a process can kick off a runner to run just a subset that you can totally manage your own tags. You can customize the crap out of that. So it's just a tool. Um, I think it's useful. And it's also useful to think about Selenium as not just a functional test. Because you can do a lot with Selenium, particularly um, now that you in Selenium 3, 
they've cleaned up a bit um, so that you can make it really easy to start uh, injecting, creating your own drivers, your own web drivers, inheriting that stuff, and being able to start pulling in, maybe doing your own timers based on a specific, uh, let's say, domain name, right, in your test. You can actually pull that information out. That's how, uh, that's how Neoload uh, measures the end user experience. So in this case, like maybe we run a subset of our Selenium tests on real devices, but while we're driving a, a huge amount of load from a protocol-based test. Right? So this is a different test artifact than the Selenium script. Selenium is about clicking and dragging and typing things in. Load tests are typically a pattern of traffic, like a hard file, like a P capture, right? so that it can scale to, to lots of infrastructure. Um, but what you want are the metrics that come from both ends. So we've been working on, tri um, on, especially with some of our large analytics providers, to be able to actually run these Selenium scripts um, in design mode, which I'm not going to have time to, to show you, but feel free to um, connect with me. The idea is you want a subset of the real user experience overlaid on your load metrics, overlaid on your server monitoring. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds in that way. Um, we'll skip past this, but ultimately this is what I'm working on right now. Uh, I don't know if they're either the people that I work with are too kind or uh, that might not be the case. You know, they might just not realize that I'm uh, not the best coder ever, but that's okay because I can branch the, the Selenium connector for our product into a develop branch and start developing the crap out of it. And I've done that. I've even found that there's actually something that I could contribute to the Selenium project that I think a lot of vendors would benefit from, which is this concept of transactions, right? Being able to specify this group of calls is about a specific workflow item. So, you know, ultimately this life cycle, we want to let people drive this from their functional scripts over having to create two types of scripts, and that's how we do that. So if you'd like, I can show you some more, but uh, clearly I do my work after hours. That's how this presentation got created. And this is sometimes what you have to do, right? Be at these meetups, talk to people after hours, really nerd out. It's not just the day job, it's the job. So uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, all I have. There's a list of uh, links at the end. DroidCon Boston is coming up next month. Definitely think about the $300 ticket. It's very worth it if you're into the mobile space. And then in two weeks, there's a DevOps meetup that I would love to see your faces at because I'd like your take on what they say over there because this is just my sort of DevOpsy perspective. But that's the real group that has a really great holistic, inclusive view of a lot of different parts of the conversation. And uh, last year's DevOps days, Boston was really fantastic. That's where I got this shit. Um, but it's going to happen again. They're just not yet quite there when it comes to organization of this year because it's so far out yet. So keep these things on the radar and uh, thank you.